Our regularly scheduled programming will not be seen at this time, so we may bring you this CNBC special presentation. Welcome to CNBC's 10th anniversary special presentation, Profiting from Experience. I'm Bill Griffith. You know, since CNBC premiered back on April 17, 1989, the world of business certainly has changed dramatically, from a mini-crash to the rise of Internet stocks. And CNBC has been there bringing you up-to-the-minute news and analysis. You know, when we first began broadcasting, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at an all-time high of 2,700. Today, of course, the Dow has surpassed 10,000. Back then, 29% of American households owned stocks. Today, 45% of households own stocks, valued, by the way, at more than a whopping $10 trillion. The effect this has had on the street and the financial world is apparent. And as the stock market has changed, so has CNBC's coverage. In this hour, we're going to take a look back at some of those benchmark events that affected the financial community and at how CNBC grew to become the number one business news channel in the world. NBC, the first network to bring radio and television into the American home, now comes to cable. There's a better place where executives can go for fast-breaking business news. Now, from CNBC Cable, a business update. A business news network is born, used by business leaders around the world. There are a lot of different ways to go with your money. Well, these are the people who can help you decide the smartest way to go. It pays to watch people who know what they're talking about. This is CNBC. As you can see, we've changed our look over the years. In fact, we started out a little bit different. Business news on television back then was known for catering to the professional investor. So if a non-professional tuned in, they sort of had to play catch up and learn the lingo. CNBC, which by the way, originally stood for Consumer News and Business Channel, wanted to change that. So from our very first day, our very first show, The Money Wheel, combined hard financial news with consumer stories. Good morning. Welcome to another hour of The Money Wheel on CNBC. I'm Kathleen Campion. And I'm Ted David. Here's what's topping the news at this hour. It's the first I was nervous. Economic data. Got there pretty early. I, I was on at 9 a.m. That was the first hour of The Money Wheel. And uh, I guess I got there at around 6.30 or so. We'll have all the details for you. You know, the interesting thing was, is that in those days, it was so new. This was, as many people have probably said, hey, let's start a TV network. I hope this works. <laughs> That's what's going through my mind. Uh, I thought we had great people. We had a very good idea, but we knew that we were going to have to struggle. The first day of CNBC, I think everyone was just a nervous wreck. But there was so much excitement because we had all worked so hard to get there. We were putting on a totally new product that was designed to really serve a number of different audiences, to serve the financial community but also the consumer, and that's not an easy thing to do. Were we going to be the consumer channel? Were we going to be the consumer news channel? Were we going to be the business channel? We would do a bond market report and then thank the reporter who did it and then immediately go into uh, some kind of dissertation on sheets and pillowcases. We talk about the commodities markets and whether uh, corn and, and, and uh, bean oil had gone higher. And then we would go out of that and have a husband and wife team arguing about whether paper or plastic shopping bags were better. We really didn't have an identity. In the late 1980s, the cable television industry was nothing like it is today. There were a lot fewer channels and not many viewers. But NBC recognized the potential of cable and wanted to expand into this new frontier. So Robert Wright, the president of NBC, took on the task. We're happy we have your attention and we promise to work hard to keep it. The issue when I came along was that we had to expand the business beyond the network and the six stations that we own. Well, we absolutely uh, had to move to a new business model. I mean, the network was coming under increasing pressure. That was even before the internet. So we were feeling the heat. And she gave us a lot of support, but still was difficult because many of the cable services 
that have become so prominent in today's viewing were already established. Bob Wright strategically saw that um, as an offensive mechanism, uh, he wanted to get into the uh, cable business. And remembering this was 1989 in the relative infancy of cable, and defensively he did it in order to protect the possible erosion of audiences uh, at the core businesses, that being the NBC television network and the owned and operated stations. And as it turned out, his vision was absolutely accurate. And his vision was to have a business news channel. There was just one problem. There was already a business news channel on cable, the Financial News Network, FNN, where I used to work. But what's a little competition? Bob Wright and I uh, looked at that situation uh, shortly after uh, he hired me to join the company in the late 80s and said, we have to be in cable programming. We cannot afford not to have a major cable network. So we looked at business news as an opportunity. FNN existed, but had fallen in financial hard times. We tried, initially, to partner with FNN, but they didn't want to do that. So we elected to start on our own. We watched from Financial News Network what CNBC was doing, and CNBC at the time was trying to do a lighter version of business news, feeling that at FNN we were too statistics oriented, that we were just these kind of green eye shade number crunchers who were quite boring and, and rather lifeless. Uh, when CNBC started, we felt that they were, you know, going to the lettuce desk during uh, market meltdowns a little bit too frequently to check on the latest, you know, uh, produce prices, which we thought was a bit frivolous. For those of you who have been following along, whoops! It's gone. We married each other in 1991, and our first challenge, or at least my first challenge and Bill Griffith's first challenge, was to come and meld with the people with whom we've been competing for two years. And it actually worked surprisingly well. As FNN interjected itself into CNBC, they focused more on Wall Street, literally Wall Street, where they became kind of a, a internet, if you will, for brokerage houses, investment banking firms, and whatnot. We changed because the needs of our viewers changed. Increasingly, individual investors were becoming players in the market. Everyday people had a personal stake in what happened on Wall Street. And as our audience grew, we focused more on the market and less on consumer stories. But one would never accuse CNBC of being a bunch of green eye shade number crunchers. To prove it, we launched a show back in 1995 named Squawk Box. Good morning, I'm Mark Haynes. This is Squawk Box. Let's get to this morning's menu. Well, the concept originally was that it would be kind of a pregame show, uh, a la, you know, the NFL broadcast. It would be a pregame show for before the markets open. You know, with, with the advent of Squawk Box, that was a, a, a very conscious decision to bring in a color man who was a professional, who knew how the game was played, who was actually playing it himself the very same day that he was talking about it. And, and we carry that throughout the day because it, these days the market does feel like a sporting event. Well, the whole focus of the show, as far as I'm concerned, is how can we make some money? Uh, that's what the point of the program is. What information do we know? What information can we get? And then pass along to the audience that will help them make money. And what better way to bring the news right to the viewer? In addition to telephoning involved parties on the spot and analyzing overnight trading, Squawk Box was the first show to put the viewer right in the thick of things by broadcasting directly from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And the first person to do that? Maria Bartiromo. When I first got down to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, I was uh, a little intimidated, a little overwhelmed, um, but I am aggressive and um, I consider myself strong, so I sort of persevered. Okay, excuse me, we are live on TV. Can okay. you just get out of the way for a second? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mark. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm standing on a floor with thousands of people running back and forth while I have an earpiece in my ear trying to listen to programming, trying to listen to where exactly we were in the live show, and speaking to a camera that was a mile away. I think I see you down there, Maria. Hi there, I am down here amongst everyone else. Anyway, we, we felt that if we had a camera right in the thick of things and me sort of handicapping everything as it was happening, that it would be in some ways demystifying investing. So Maria persevered just like CNBC itself. You know, from day one, CNBC has been there to bring you the play-by-play, -play, the analysis, and the information. Stay with us. We're going to take a look back at some of the crazy times in the stock market, the good times and the troublesome ones that have affected our financial lives. 
Also, a peek at some of the bloopers our young channel had to endure. This is the new home of CNBC, now under construction. I'm standing in the main studio, and although it's hard to imagine right now, it's going to end up looking like this. I will be working at the main anchor desk. I'll be sitting right about here where that chair is. Welcome back to CNBC's 10th anniversary special, Profiting from Experience. I'm Sue Herrera. Well, as you can see, we did get the set constructed, and then we were on our way. And it wasn't very long before we were faced with our first big financial news story, the mini crash of 1989. In the early days of CNBC, it was kind of tough because there were a few big stories uh, that took place. The, the failure of UAL, which was then called Allegis Corporation, to be bought out created this big stock market problem. It just bottom fell out, I don't know. The trigger, the apparent collapse of the management-led buyout of United Airlines. It brought trading in the junk bond market to almost a complete stop. That in turn set off a selling spree in stocks, and in the final hour of trading, we have carnage. The doomsayers were outside the New York Stock Exchange predicting another Black Monday. Analysts say it probably won't happen again because the market is much more fairly valued this time around. The market and CNBC made it out of the mini crash with only scratches. We passed our first trial by fire, and our programming was really starting to take shape. On the other hand, the country was in a slump, and that put a damper on everyone's spirits, and it created a reporting challenge for us. Iraqi troops now occupy all government buildings in Kuwait's capital. The financial markets have responded to the crisis with confusion and turmoil. In the Persian Gulf, maintaining a military presence is a costly enterprise. The shooting war in the Middle East will push stock prices substantially lower. Rising oil prices threaten to trigger a recession and higher inflation. Bad news all around. Stocks remain caught between the fears of war in the Persian Gulf and the certainty of recession at home. We got into the 1991-92 period, and, and the stories were not things that you could bring home to people so easily, or if they were, they really didn't want to hear about it. A dismal third quarter for the nation's biggest car maker. The company expects the recession to be long and harsh. Home builders feared they'd be the first to be hit. Continental was recently forced into bankruptcy for a second time. Eastern has struggled to get out of bankruptcy all Pan year. Am says it is laying off 4,000 employees. The company's cut 25,000 workers last month. This is going to damage the economy. Conditions are horrible. Painful. Terrible tough times. This will be the worst recession since the depression. People don't like the recession story necessarily. It's kind of hard to cut out a niche for yourself doing bad economic news and bad market news all the time, which is where we were in the early 90s. The nation's central bank did an about fate. It must keep interest rates low. The dollar hits a new record low against the Japanese yen. It's all downhill from there. This will be a drag on the economy. And the mood so far is depressing. We were all struggling to figure out a way to cover this so it was compelling for people. The biggest challenge we face at CNBC is simply to make this very complicated information uh, as understandable to the individual investor as we can and to use the technology that we have available. You've got the ticker going across the bottom of the screen. That's our signature. And we have to educate people about how to read the ticker. I mean, that was an art form on Wall Street in the 20s. It was called tape reading. Green shows a stock moving up, red a stock moving down. We had to educate people about it, but at the same time we made the ticker a little more understandable, a little easier to read. And that is the CNBC ticker. Profit from it. The lower right-hand corner of the screen now has what we call the triple bug, uh, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. And I look at that now, I remember when we first put, a, put that up there, and I thought, you know, what are we doing here? We're going to confuse everybody with all these numbers and things on the screen. But now I look at it and I think, how did we ever get along without that? That's mesmerizing. You can sit for hours and watch that uh, as the, the trading day unfolds. From the ticker to the constant market updates, we here at CNBC understand how important it is to stay on top of the news. Market Watch, which premiered last year, is a great way to keep abreast of what's going on on the street. The goal, I think, of all of our programming is to keep the viewer informed insofar as business is concerned. But when we are on during market watch hours, uh, which is 10 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern time, the market has been open a half hour. This is a busy time. Good morning and welcome to our 10 a.m. We're getting uh, fresh economic statistics out, which have to be assimilated and 
looked at. Uh, the bond market reacts to these things, stock market reacts to them. We are now trying to get guests uh, as these numbers come out who can talk about these data. It's a vital, volatile part of the trading day. And it isn't only breaking news stories that we cover. There are times when some stories are so important that continuing coverage is required. I think the most important thing we did in recent years was when the SEC investigated the NASDAQ market makers. Now, there had always been complaints, and the SEC did a rather lengthy two-year investigation and uh, concluded that, in fact, all of the public suspicions were correct, that they were being robbed and uh, stabbed in the back and being uh, badly treated by the market makers on the NASDAQ. And when that study came out, it was kind of back burner. No one was paying that much attention to it. So I spent a week every morning on Squawk Box reading parts of that report so people would understand uh, the pitfalls that lay out there and how the NASDAQ market makers were ripping them off. And it was uh, not without controversy. In fact, the NASDAQ canceled its advertising on my program as a result of that activity. Uh, they were back about three or four months later. And sure enough, within a year, they had instituted reforms in the NASDAQ, which uh, greatly changed the situation. It's not nearly what it used to be. Uh, it's probably the single most important thing we did for investors over the years. So we made it through the mini crash of 89, the recession of the early 90s, and we changed our programming to more fully cover the equity markets. When we come back, we'll take a look at some of the benchmark events that helped create the longest bull market in Wall Street history. Welcome back. This is CNBC's 10th anniversary special, Profiting from Experience. I'm Maria Bartiromo. Well, I told you about my first day reporting live from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, but that was nothing compared to the wild ride the stock market began one decade ago. The country was climbing out of the crash mentality, and I think CNBC came along at a time when people were starting to look forward again in terms of their investments, in terms of the sense of renewal of their own fortune, if you will. It is another record. Everybody jumps on a bandwagon and that's it. Dow has hit 5,000. It's um, very, 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 very bullish market. Stunning performance for the market. Gold, Irrational exuberance. A truly incredible day on Wall Street. It's cool. The Dow Industrials breaking 7,000. Dow Industrials soared above that 8,000. Closing line. above 9,000 for the first time. You can never get it. The Dow Industrials as we speak, 10,000.95 and rising. It is truly amazing when you realize that in 1995, the Dow was at 5,000. It doubled in just four years. And throughout this record rally, CNBC's coverage has kept the pace. These days, you need every advantage that you can get. And that's exactly what we've been trying to give you since 1997 with our program, The Edge. This is The Edge with Sue Herrera. The Dow breaks another record. So much of the news that affects tomorrow's trading session happens late in the day, significantly after the closing bell. Have you ever seen a move this big in the utility average no. in a single day? Joe Kernan um, and I try and take all the late breaking stocks news and tell people what's expected for tomorrow's trading session so that they can go to bed at night already having formulated whatever their investment plan will be for tomorrow. Here at CNBC, we believe that you, the viewer, can never be too informed. Certainly not in this changing market, one of the very exciting areas of change in the 90s has been the new public offerings. The last decade was awash with huge IPOs. Let's take a look. We're going to talk to the CEO of Amazon.com. The market for initial public offerings heating up. IPOs are very, very, very hot. Too hot? Overblown? Yes. Cool heads will not prevail. It could be a wild ride. Possibly one of the biggest IPO events of the last decade was the spin-off of Lucid Technologies from AT&T. Broke itself in three. Broke itself into NCR, Lucent, and AT&T. It was unusual to see a major American corporation break itself off into its smaller parts. In fact, that was a watershed day for Squawk Box because the announcement came just as Squawk Box was starting that day. Just before we went on the air, I was talking to Victor Sparano. And we simply threw out 
the plan and uh, started talking about the AT&T decision. The biggest IPO ever, not just one of the biggest. It's a tremendous feeling to be launching the company. After uh, talking about Lucent since last September, it's fun to see it all come together. It dramatically changed uh, the landscape. Corporations now, no matter how big, had to consider, uh, are we doing the right thing by remaining big? Maybe we'd be better off if we were smaller. Despite all of the IPOs and spin-offs throughout the decade, perhaps the 90s will ultimately be known for the emergence of Internet stocks. And one of the best places to find out what's going on with Internet stocks premiered back in 1996. And it's called Street Signs. Street Signs it was designed to be, to ultimately become the last quarter of a Knicks basketball game. We want to do everything we can to drive people to that last two minutes where when the closing bell rings, they're fully informed. They know exactly what happened that day. They know who the winners and the losers are and what the final score was. Internet stocks in a leadership role today, beginning with Amazon.com. Netscape. Yahoo. E-Trade. Priceline. Excite. Value America. InfoC. eBay. iVillage. Microsoft. Lycos. People are making killings in these stocks. The Internet craze will probably be the one event that will characterize the 1990s bull market for all time, if it ends badly. If ever there was an 800-pound gorilla, it is America Online. AOL is now worth $150 billion. I'm thinking of putting a dot-com on the end of my name, because it seems like everything with a dot-com, um, especially these days, is golden. Traditional benchmarks from valuing a company went out the window and people just got involved with a craze that was similar to uh, the stock market craze here in the 1920s or in Japan in the 1980s or even the craze for tulip bulbs in the 1600s in Holland. It's probably a mania and if it is it means that we might be in the late stages of this bull market cycle. If it turns out to be a rational investing process that the internet is so much a transformational business that you can pay any price for any of these companies and make money, then we're all wrong and, and we really misunderstand market history. So <laughs> it's gonna be an interesting question that's probably not gonna be answered for a couple more years. And we'll be there to cover it for you when the final word is written on the phenomenon of the internet companies. But that's not all that happened in the 90s. There were mergers and acquisitions and the entrance into the market by millions of individuals. So what effect has that had on the market? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome back to CNBC's 10th anniversary special, Profiting from Experience. I'm Mark Haynes. The 1990s certainly saw its share of mergers. Some say they were different in nature from the mergers of the 80s. Those were mostly hostile. In the 90s, they say the mergers were mostly friendly. Whichever the case, the robust economy fueled the urge to merge. AT&T and British Telecom are set to announce an international joint venture. Bell Atlantic and Ninex are hooking up. Germany's Daimler, Benz, and Chrysler. The $1.9 billion bank merger. Bell Atlantic and GTE. In the 80s, it was very much led by financiers who used uh, uh, junk bonds to acquire companies, generally break them up, and then reap the profits. In the 90s, it was a much more strategic corporate maneuver. And a lot of the companies were benefiting from rising stock prices. So rather than having to borrow money, they could use their stock to buy other companies and do the deals that they long before couldn't afford. Mergers and acquisitions have occurred because of corporate America's attempts to become more efficient, to generate stronger profits. It's all good news. As the stock market continued to get strong, it made it that much easier for companies to continue uh, the pace of merger and acquisitions until we hit this crescendo in 1998 where we did a trillion dollars worth of deals domestically and uh, nearly double that on a global scale. Mergers were not the only force fueling the market. The last decade saw the biggest increase in individual investors ever. By the millions, individual investors were drawn into the market. They stuck it out through the slumps and began to learn how to take control of their own financial destiny. And CNBC was there, educating people about their investments from the beginning. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to your portfolio. In case you hadn't seen us yet, we're CNBC's new program about mutual funds. People let us know that there was more to life than just mutual funds. They wanted to invest for retirement and college 
and uh, to buy a new home and things like that. So the new incarnation of that program became the Money Club. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to The Money Club, the interactive personal finance show here at CNBC. I'm Bill Griffith. We are very excited about tonight's program because we formed this club specifically with you in mind. We try to cover a very wide range of people. We try to talk about investing that might affect their personal life, investing in their retirement years, even, you know, how to put away enough money to get a car quickly or things of that nature. So I think we've broadened the base of viewership dramatically. And CNBC continues to change its programming as the needs of our viewers change. Through the years, our viewers have become more and more sophisticated. They no longer have to ask what a mutual fund is. Instead, they want to know who was running the companies they were investing in. In 1996, we launched Power Lunch as a place to answer those questions. You know, the, the scouting report on Hewlett Packard for years has just been consistent growth, and it didn't happen the last few years. Was an execution problem, or do you just blame it on Asia? I love Power Lunch. Power Lunch is this, started out as sort of this amorphous program during the day. I'm Bill Griffith. Glad you're with us. Here are some of the things people will be talking about over lunch today. I mean, it was easy on the open, when the stock market opens, to do sort of a pregame show, if you will. And that's what Squawk Box is all about. And it's easy at the end of the day to do sort of a post-game show when the market closes, and that's what Market Wrap's about. But what do you do in the middle of the day there? Now, here's a website that lays out that very technique. It is called Dogs of the Dow. Today, the individual out there is deciding what stocks or mutual funds he or she wants to buy, deciding where exactly they want to put their money, and doing it, doing the research, doing the homework. The good news is they're able to do that because of vehicles like CNBC. And people are watching and learning. In fact, they're watching in some very interesting places. Uh, when I watch, I'm usually working out. <laughs> I've seen it at Sloppy Joe's while I was in a bathing suit, <laughs> drinking a margarita in, in Key West. When I'm traveling uh, and I'm sitting in my hotel and I want to know what happens, I look CNBC. I've seen it in Prague, I've seen it in Dublin, I've seen it in London, I've seen it in Paris. I haven't seen it. I even saw it in Cuba, in Havana. <laughs> We are living in a unique period in history. Low interest rates, low inflation, strong earnings, and the longest bull market in history. Now you couple that with an increasingly educated public, we have some very interesting news. When you come back, you'll see that in the early days of CNBC, it wasn't always so easy to get that fascinating news from here on the air. On seven minutes now, before, after the half hour, that is, what am I saying? Here's what's topping the news at the half hour. Uh, a slew of a slew of a slew of economic statistics are out this morning. You know the uh, ticker you see. What is it right about over here that covers my midriff bulge? It's going to be missing for about a half hour. We're going to do a little technical work on it. All the better to serve you, my dear. And when it comes back, it'll be back and better. So if you don't see it for a while, you'll understand why. And on the health front, scientists reveal chicken skin causes claustrophobia. Research shows rare minerals in milk can cause uncontrollable shaking. From food to finance, there's a better way to get consumer and business information. Raw celery causes male impotence. NBC comes to cable with CNBC. All you need to get through life 24 hours a day. Welcome back, I'm Ted David, and this is CNBC's 10th anniversary special, Profiting from Experience. Tonight, we've taken you from the inception of CNBC and the beginning of the 90s bull market through some of the major events that have us arriving in 1999, trying to catch our collective breaths. We've shown you how CNBC has covered these events. We've told you why we're pleased you watch us. But we'd be remiss in our coverage if we didn't include some of the moments that make us human. These moments we might like to forget otherwise known as bloopers. What was that all about? Yeah. How can I say that? Uh, let's get to Maria Bartiromo speaking of timing. Maria, what's hey, up? Thank you very much, Mark. We've got a lot going on. Oh, we're on air. Oh. 
<laughs> As I was saying, excuse me, we've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average up about 37 points. <laughs> the NASDAQ Composite higher as well by two and a half points. Our, our guest is David Kahn. He's tax partner with Golub Goldstein, Golub, and Kessler. This is my earring. Excuse me. Welcome back. I can't see him very well. If we pull back on that shot, we've got these poinsettias or poinsettias, whatever they're called here. Somebody rolling prompter here? There's nobody rolling anything. Is there anybody on prompter? Just styling the leaves here. Hello. Okay, we have to put up with this, folks. You know, we have a little construction going on occasionally here. The fact is, it wasn't too long ago we were looking at 4.6% surge. And I think that's the Germans right, right now on that's the phone. Right. Anyway, uh, they're up 4.6% per second. Okay, Hang please up the take phone care of that. There we are. All right. I told you never to call <laughs> me, by the way. <laughs> You know, bloopers happen to the best of us. I'll never forget the time I was on the air with Leslie Carday. She was my first co-anchor here. And the producer told me to stretch, so I started stretching. And I started talking about lawns and lawn mowers and fertilizers. Anyway, this went on and on and on, and nobody told me to stop because they didn't know where to go next. You know, you use lawn chemicals. And if you also use the chinch bug killers and the things that get rid of sod worms, you also may be one of those people who likes to get rid of crabgrass. They have the pre-emerging crabgrass killer. Hold it! I want to ask a question. Mark. Once again, we have been talking about uh, from the brokers would, uh, would come these pink pieces of paper with the quotes for these stocks. They weren't very liquid. You couldn't easily buy or sell them. And one day I referred to those as stocks as being pink sh stocks. The email was interesting from some of our viewers. Then sometimes you give a simple assignment to a dedicated person, and what do they do? They do exactly what you tell them to do. We were trying to come up with a, uh, an angle on this internet phenomenon that people were starting to discover and make it a visual story as much as possible. Now, Bob Pisani is one of our best reporters. So we said to Bob, Bob, we need a story about the internet. And he came up with a doozy. Good, clean, fun, nobody's getting hurt, nobody's doing anything wrong. Welcome to NTL Communications, where models pose in front of cameras, sending live images through computers. But the really interesting part of all this is how the money is made. NTL doesn't even have its own website. Instead, it encourages others to build their own websites and then link to NTL. He came up with a story that had plenty of visuals, that's for sure. Uh, it was interesting to watch, and in fact it was so interesting to watch that when we aired it for the first time during the trading day, trading came to a virtual halt on the New York Stock Exchange, and for a while, Wall Street stopped. It was a great moment. Look, you got to figure, with 14 hours of live television every day, there are going to be some mistakes. I mean, if someone hadn't finally decided to go to some videotape, I think I'd still be talking about lawnmowers. I do want to remind you, I don't know about you, but again, I have taken out the lawnmower and the edger after storing it for, for a very, very long period of time. Alan, who we presume is a Democrat, says he doesn't mind making an ass out of himself for a good cause. I can say that. It's cable, right? You want to get into films like some of the other people that no, have been stand-up no, comedy? Why I not? Want, I want to hack around on cable here with you. Oh, come on. Let's I be wanna, real here. No. I want to do shows with bonsai trees. <laughs> No one can, can see that. We're talking about a, a wide shot here of our... Really? It makes you want to talk. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what else has happened. So many things happened. There were the fires. Uh, we, we are going to have to leave again. The, uh, we are told that there's a problem and therefore we need to leave. There I were the floods. Out, she was downstairs longer. Right. There was the explosion in the family. building. And as a result of all that, one time I ended up doing the news on the Saturday Night Live set, which I never thought I'd have to do. So. Things like that, just a lot of good memories. Sue's right. 
a lot of good memories. So come right back and we'll look at how our expectations at the beginning of the decade matched up with the reality by the end of the decade. I mean, did you ever really think that the tie bot was that important? You want to check the blades on a lawnmower to make sure that they are tight. The edger, you want to be sure that that's running properly. I think before we do any more about the lawn, I think they want to run a package on the stock market. Do they? Yeah. Welcome back to CNBC's 10th anniversary special, Profiting from Experience. I'm Ron Insana. Well, we've been through a lot together these past 10 years, and it's been a great time. But no matter how informed we are and how diligently we check and double check, there are always those trends, companies, or events that just don't turn out quite the way we planned. Well, everybody thought that Asia, um, Japan in particular, and to a certain extent, Indonesia and Thailand, um, you know, they were the economies of the future. That's where the growth was, that's where the money was going, that's where the manufacturing was. Uh, and certainly for a long time that was the case. But those who think that a market and an economy can only go up and grow, they're being pretty foolish because that's not always the case. A series of equity and currency setbacks have rocked Asia. Hong Kong stocks fell to their lowest levels in three years today. The leading institutions are burdened by billions of dollars of bad debt. Aid to ailing Asian countries is in the United States' best Korea's interest. Korea's currency has plunged to panic Korean citizens try to dump increasingly devalued yuan for dollars. For the first time in modern history, a market meltdown has forced a trading halt at the New York Stock Exchange. Well, I've never seen that. I don't think anybody else has. Well, let me show you the trade chomping at the bit, ready to go. How bad of a hit is the street taking in this sell-off today? I have no idea. That whole story, I think, really put us on the map with a big star. Uh, we were there before, but now people really knew where we were, who we were, and what we could do. Like no other event, the Asian crisis made us all realize that we live in a global economy, and that by linking together our computers through the Internet, our entire way of doing business was on the brink of change. When Internet stocks first emerged on the market, they were virtually overlooked by Wall Street. No one thought that companies that had, well, no company, no assets, and in some cases no furniture, could actually have value. But we learned they could. Uh, Amazon is one we want to talk about uh, to start with. Uh, every day, Amazon seems to, uh, wow. There is something to talk about since Good. last time. It was 168 last time. Everything on fire today here at the NASDAQ. Some of the price earnings ratios of this sector are stratospheric. Some aren't, mostly because there are no earnings yet. I can tell you one thing for sure about the Internet stocks. The experts who cover them on a daily basis really can't define what this sector is going to do next. It is just so volatile, so speculative, so new, so breathtaking, and there is a whole lot of money being made and lost. Let's give them a check on the Internet stock, shall okay. we? This morning, some yep. cross currents here. Something of a decoupling seeming to take place yesterday. The Internet seems to be the wave of the future. It's the newest phenomenon. Some people liken it to the biotech stocks of the 1980s. Others say it's two and three times bigger than that. If you listen closely, you can hear investors around the country screaming Yahoo as the number one portal site company blew past the consensus estimate for the fourth quarter. Revenue up 181% over last year. Amazon.com stock continuing to soar on a day when its stock split three to one. Shows of E-Trade today, which have risen, by the way, 110%. Earlier today, Bill Gates told NBC the software giant is in ongoing discussions to settle the antitrust lawsuit the U.S. government brought against his company. If there's a reasonable way to settle this thing that preserves our ability to make Windows a better product, to keep supporting the Internet more and more, then we'd love to do that. Where will the Internet mania end? Well, that's an interesting question that only time will answer. But CNBC, of course, will be here when the answer comes to light. And we'll be here because we're still expanding. We're growing, still changing, to continually bring you the best and most comprehensive business news available. To that end, in December of 1997, we teamed with the Dow Jones. Wherever business happens, you are there. Because CNBC has combined resources with the Wall Street Journal, connecting you to bureaus across the country, around the world, from New York to L.A., London to Tokyo. Instantaneous reports, 92 worldwide locations, the largest business news network in the world. Get your business news where it happens, as it happens. The Wall Street Journal and CNBC. Profit from it. This alliance combines CNBC with the Wall Street Journal 
to create the dominant source for financial news in the world. Back with more Halftime Report. Here they are with the envelopes. Bob O'Brien and Larry Bauman of Dow Jones Newswires. And we certainly hope that if uh, any of these companies want to accept their awards, a la Roberto Benigni, we'd be happy to... Uh, Give them the time on the air, right? Provide them a chair to jump on? You bet. CNBC.com, your link to worldwide business news. And in the future, where we see opportunities to bring you the world's best coverage of financial news, we will continue to do so. You know, it's been a great time serving you over the last 10 years. And in the end, it is really and truly about you, the viewer. In October, when the market uh, went down by several hundred points for some reason, some way, I got a call uh, from a viewer who was a retired teacher from California whose pension plan was fully funded in the equity markets. And she asked me, am I in trouble? And I said, no, watch CNBC and it'll fulfill and give you a comfort level of what is happening. So what used to be a mystery where she had nobody to even call, she didn't know who I was as a person but she knew what CNBC and the brand stood for, and that was comfort. So I'm very pleased that we as CNBC can help people through their financial lives and dreams. When I go out to investment conferences, when I meet viewers on the street, wherever it is, in restaurants, they're always thanking me. And it happens to all of us who are on CNBC. They thank us for how we've helped them get their financial act together, if you will. That by itself, for me, is what I'm most proud of. We've actually made a difference in their lives, a positive difference. I'm proud to be on the CNBC team because it has enabled me to bring to the public information that otherwise is not widely disseminated. I'm proud to be able to give my viewers an opportunity to have a leg up on somebody else and an opportunity to have the information and market news first before anyone else. The greatest enjoyment I get is the fact that people can watch my program and actually be financially better off as a result. And there aren't many programs on television that, that can make that claim. It's just a great group of people and I think everyone works incredibly hard to get accurate information out to the viewer and they really do think about the viewer in everything they do. I think we've got a hell of a product. We've got a wonderful team of anchors. Uh, you, you get up at 5 until 7.30. You can get great anchors doing great stuff on business news, and if you want to know what's happening around the world, that's the place to go. It just like happened. Sure, it happened because of the blood, sweat, and tears and hard work of, of a lot of people, but suddenly you realize, my goodness, look at this place. And um, so I look at it because I was there on day one and, and used to do three and four hours of money wheel a day as, as a very proud parent. It is a very bright future. And uh, that's, I guess, I'm, I'm, I'm happiest about. Everybody wants to be associated with a success. And I think we really have one here in CNBC in the United States and in Europe and Asia as well. And, and we, have, we have a lot more in front of us than we have behind us. And together, we've all helped to make CNBC the thing we always believed it could be. We've worked hard to make CNBC what you, the viewer, needs us to be as well. To inform you, to challenge you, to educate you. We're all essentially trying to achieve the same goal, how to navigate these financial waters and come out on top. We hope to be with you on your journey and stay with you once you've reached your goals. From all of us here at CNBC, it's been a pleasure broadcasting to you over the first 10 years, and we're looking forward to the next 10. So, as they say, don't touch that dial.